Okay, so before we actually go into modern philosophy, we're going to talk about the historical background, focusing on the philosophies, including what's going to happen in the historical periods. We'll cover that quickly and move on to philosophers who are relevant from the beginning of modern philosophy. They're not included in, I didn't include it in the modern philosophy time because I didn't feel like they were actually modern philosophers, but they are still relevant in this period as well. So modern philosophy. So the 16th century was the time of Renaissance. You probably know what it is. There's the Northern and Southern Renaissance. And the most famous thinkers in that era was Erasmus and Sir Thomas More. So during the Renaissance, what people did in philosophy was that instead of just looking at Aristotle or the interpretations of Aristotle from the scholastic period, they looked back and saw other thinkers that we covered during our classical period. They saw Greek people or Roman people and they developed their thoughts upon those people. So there, Erasmus and Sir Thomas More, the most, most famous people in this era, the 16th century. Erasmus wrote the Praise of Foley and Sir Thomas More wrote Utopia. The Praise of Foley are just basically attacks of religion. It wasn't that condemned by the church for some reason but erasmus was a key figure in the fact that he did promote attacks against religion which is almost unheard of in the medieval period more wrote the book utopia which is more interesting utopia deals with in his idea as he defined it an ideal state he argued that a utopia is when everybody has a job there's no physical conflict there's no mental conflicts there's no anything and that people get exactly what they want and he argued that utopia was the good best state for utopia if you read the book it's not as philosophical as it is literary it's more about the literature and the terms he uses and blah 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 it's not there's no real proofs or ideas or reasoning why he thought that utopia would work or why that's the best idea of course, Thomas More influenced thousands of people after him, including Karl Marx, who argued that communism was the best utopia, and that utopia is similar to More. But Thomas More didn't really have a merit himself as a philosopher, he was more of an influential thinker. Machiavelli was another political theorist in this period. He wrote The Prince and the Discourses of the Republic. So, the problem right now is whether Machiavelli wrote The Prince or the discourses faithfully because both ideas contradict each other. The prince calls for a dictatorship, an absolute, absolute dictatorship, while the discourses say a republic is the best form of government. Most people say that discourses were the were ones written truthfully and that the prince was satire, but that's disputed. So we'll just treat both with philosophical merit, but focus on the prince since that's more influential. He argued that as a rule, there should be three factors. There should be fear, faithfulness, and trust. He argued that of those three, fear was the most important thing. He keep giving examples of those Roman generals and old time people and contemporary time periods by arguing that those people had fear as a factor and that's why they succeeded. He argued that power was the most important thing to have as a monarch and that in that case there's a quote attributed to him by saying that the end justifies the means of course this isn't necessarily co necessarily correct but it does reflect his idea that if something is achieved whatever it means to use it, it is good to achieve that mean so that does reflect his meaning basis on just that the scientific revolution in the 17th century were a little bit more interesting than the Renaissance. Instead of just thinking about philosoph philosophy and reasoning, they decided to examine the world using the inductive method and talked about what is known as sciences today. So the major thinking for the scientific revolution would be Francis Bacon, the guy who died while ch stuffing snow into chicken lungs and caught hypothermia. So Francis Bacon argued that knowledge is power. If Tia Scientia Potisas is knowledge itself is power, and he argued that learning was the most important thing. He tried to classify philosophy into a system, which didn't work quite as well because people rejected it, and he argued for a systemization of sciences. He's more famous in developing the scientific method than actual philosophy, but he did have a philosophy in well that it corresponded with what was science at the time. He argued that there should be observations and categories and rules and laws that philosophy people really didn't like. So Descartes is the greatest philosopher in this time. He wrote the discourse and the method of rightly conducting one's reasons and meditations in philosophy, his best works in metaphysics. Of course, his main argument is that I exist because I think. I think, therefore I am. The better interpretation would be I think, therefore I exist, but I think, I, therefore I am will work. He argued that even if everything is stripped away, this is a summary by the way, you should read the Meditations and Philosophy for a better insight into this. He argued that even if everything is stripped away, what makes me, me is just my thinking. You can't take thinking away from me and as long as I have doubts, as long as I think, there has to be some method of conducting that still works that way and that is my mind. So he argued that what I am is my mind. 
However, the problem is that he said that the mind existed independently of the body because he argued for the mind's existence by stripping away all things that he could be doubtful, including the body, but he could not doubt the mind. Now, this runs into a problem called the mind-body problem in the case that when you say that the mind and body are fundamentally different things, then it's impossible for them to influence each other. If mind is, say, made out of material A and body is made out of material B, there's no connection between material A and material B that can control each other. If, when you say, I'll raise my hand and the mind is separate from the body, there's no way that the concept or thought or order, I'll raise my hand would get translated to my body. So he created this problem and he didn't really solve it, which leads to uh, implications later on in the history of philosophy. So he proved this world by first saying that I exist, therefore I am, and then by using his mind to say I have a clear and distinct idea of God, which is why God would exist, because my thoughts are the only one that's trustworthy, and the idea of God is the most trustworthy of all, and then by saying that God was a naturally good person to prove the world. This is sometimes seen as circular reasoning. Most people don't really like it because it's a form of begging the question, the fact that I exist, the world exists because there's a supremely powerful being who makes it exist, which is not showing anything at all. Of course, one more thing that could be said with Descartes is that he created an argument to throw himself into doubt in the beginning of his meditation philosophy. He called it the dream argument, and he said that it's impossible to distinguish dreams from reality while we're exper experiencing a dream. He rebutted this later by saying that, however, this feels too real, but in that case, he never actually properly addressed why this world would not be a dream, and thus that became problems later on as well.